Okay, so this evening we're going to talk about extended treatment of venous thromboembolism. If I can have the next slide, please. Okay, so why are we talking about extended treatment of venous thromboembolism? And the reason we need to discuss this is because there's a high risk of recurrence in many patients with venous thromboembolism after they stop anticoagulation therapy. And you can see on the graph on the right-hand side of this slide Excuse that me. there's a risk of recurrent VTE of about 10% in the first year if anticoagulation is stopped. And this goes up to about 30% at five years and 40% at 10 years. So although, although the risk declines over time, it still means that there's about a 30% risk of recurrent VTE in five years if anticoagulation is stopped. And as I'm sure all of you know now, the non-vitamin K oral anticoagulants or the direct oral anticoagulants, which include Rivaroxaban, Xarelto, Apixaban, Eliquis, Dibigatran, Pradaxa, and uh, idoxaban, which in the U.S. is Vesa, these agents are, are well suited for extended treatment of VTE because they are given orally. They don't require routine coagulation monitoring, and they have few drug-drug uh, or food-drug interactions. Next slide. Okay. Uh, for the Zoomies? Now, here we, we see the risk of uh, recurrence according to baseline risk factors. So the bottom line there, the black line, shows that in patients whose VTE was provoked by a major transient risk factor, such as surgery, the risk of recurrence when you stop anticoagulation is very low. It's about 1% at a year and maybe 5% at five years. In contrast, if you look at the top line, in patients with unprovoked VTE, this is VTE that doesn't occur in the presence of any recognized risk factors like surgery or trauma or immobilization or cancer. In this sort of VTE, the risk of recurrence is about 10% at one year, and about 15% at two years. And in between are the VTEs that are provoked by non-surgical risk factors. So these could be minor persistent risk factors, such as obesity, for example, or renal impairment. Here, the risk of recurrence is intermediate between those that are provoked by transient risk factors and those that are unprovoked. So it's very important when we think about how long to treat VTE that we know the circumstances around the uh, first episode of VTE, whether it was provoked by a major transient risk factor like surgery or whether it was unprovoked. Next slide. Now, here are the... Uh, current American College of Test Physician guidelines in terms of duration of anticoagulation therapy for unprovoked deep vein thrombosis or pulmonary embolism. And it doesn't matter whether your VTE was unprovoked or provoked, the, everybody gets treated for three months. And then the suggestion is that if you have unprovoked VTE, that you get extended anticoagulation if the bleeding risk is not high. If the bleeding risk is high, then the risk of bleeding might outweigh the risk of recurrence, and then you just get three months. But for everyone whose bleeding risk is not high, the current guidelines suggest extended anticoagulation, and the European Society of Cardiology guidelines for treatment of pulmonary embolism also have the same recommendation that for unprovoked pulmonary embolism, 
that extended anticoagulation be given, provided that the risk of bleeding is not high. The guidelines on both uh, uh, guidelines also give preference to the use of the NOAX over vitamin K antagonists such as warfarin for treatment of VTE as long as there isn't active cancer. If there's active cancer, then the suggestion is that low molecular weight heparin is preferred. Next slide. Okay, you can press it again, please. Okay, so this is the balancing act that we do when deciding whether or not to extend treatment. So when we get to that three months point, we balance the risk of recurrence if we stop anticoagulation with the risk of bleeding if we continue anticoagulation and we also take into account patient's preference. Some patients want to get off anticoagulants and uh, they don't want to be bothered by the possibility of bleeding and others are so worried about a recurrence they don't want to stop. So this is the balancing act that we do and treatment with uh, anticoagulants, whether it's warfarin or whether it's a NOAC, reduces the risk of recurrence by over 80% uh, compared with the So in order to try and minimize the risk of bleeding with continued anticoagulation, attempts have been made to either substitute aspirin instead of anticoagulation therapy or use lower doses of anticoagulant for extended treatment to try and reduce the burden of bleeding. When studies were done with lower doses of warfarin, the reduction in the risk of recurrence was not as great as it was with full dose warfarin and there wasn't much of an effect on bleeding. But this is different with the NOAC that I'm going to show you. Next slide. So in the Einstein Choice Study, which we reported just a few months ago in the New England Journal, we took patients with documented pulmonary embolism, deep vein thrombosis, or both, who had completed six to 12 months of anticoagulation therapy for their index event, and we randomized them to one of three treatment arms, as you see here. They either got rivaroxaban, 20 milligrams once daily, rivaroxaban, 10 milligrams once daily, or aspirin at a dose of 100 milligrams once daily, which is the low-dose aspirin regimen that's used in uh, Europe. Now, why did we choose these three treatment arms? Next slide, please. Well, the 20 milligram once daily dose is the treatment dose of rivaroxaban. And in the Einstein extension study, this dose of rivaroxaban was compared with placebo, and it reduced the risk of recurrent VTE by 82% compared with placebo, and there was a similar risk of bleeding. The 10 milligram once daily dose of rivaroxaban is the prophylactic, the preventive dose of rivaroxaban that reduces the risk of VTE after major orthopedic surgery, such as uh, hip replacement or knee replacement surgery. And the aspirin is chosen because aspirin has been shown to reduce the risk of recurrent VTE by about 30% compared with placebo in two studies, one done in uh, Italy and one done in Australia. So the Einstein Choice study was undertaken to test the hypothesis that both doses of rivaroxaban would be superior to aspirin for prevention of recurrent VTE. And we thought also that there may be a difference in 
bleeding rates with the two different doses of Grimroxan. Next slide. So the primary efficacy outcome was recurrent VTE, and the principal safety outcome was major bleeding. So we looked at the balance between recurrent episodes of VTE and serious bleeding. Next slide. Now this slide's a little bit uh, busy, but all I want you to see is the characteristics of the patients who are entered in this in the study. Uh, you can see on the top that about 50% were men and 50% were women. The mean age was about 58 years, which is pretty typical for patients with venous thromboembolism. About a third of the patients had a body mass index uh, greater than or equal to 30, which is uh, evidence of obesity. And most people had normal renal function, again, consistent with the younger age group in the study. Next slide. One third was obese, but two thirds. A half of the patients, oh, we lost the slides there. A half of the patients had deep vein thrombosis, and the other half had a pulmonary embolism with or without associated deep vein thrombosis. And a unique feature of this study is that 40% of the patients had unprovoked VTE, and 60% had provoked VTE. But we'll discuss a little bit more later what we meant by unprovoked and provoked in the study. About 20% had a history of prior VTE, about 7% had known thrombophilia, only a minority, only 2% had active cancer. That's not surprising because in this study, patients could have been randomized to aspirin, and most of us as physicians would not be comfortable randomizing a patient with active cancer to aspirin in place of an anticoagulant. And uh, patients were treated essentially for a maximum of one year. Next slide. Okay, here are the results of the study. So this is the efficacy results. So both rivaroxaban doses provided superior reduction in recurrent VTE rate compared with aspirin. So you see aspirin on the top there, that recurrence rate of about 4.4%, and both doses of rivaroxaban reduced the risk by about 70%. So the risk of recurrence with the 20 milligram dose was 1.5%. Dr. Weitz, are you there? It seems like we might have lost Dr. Weitz momentarily, so we'll give him a minute to sign back on. But everybody, in the meantime, please mute your lines. If your line is not muted, you can hear everything in the background. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. There's a lot of in the background here. Okay. Okay. So the bottom line here is that compared with aspirin, both doses of rivaroxaban reduced the risk of recurrence by 70%. Next slide. Did we miss a slide? Yeah. Okay, no, no, this is it. Okay, we got it. And yep. the, we saw the same reduction regardless of whether the patients had deep vein thrombosis, pulmonary embolism, or both. Again, you can see the, the overall results on the left, and then the results in patients who had DVT or the results in patients who had PE. So it didn't matter what the index event was. 
DVT or PE, again, both doses of rivaroxaban were superior to aspirin. Next slide. Now, what about safety? And the bottom line here with safety was that if we looked at rates of major bleeding, the rates of major bleeding were low with all three treatment, uh, treatments and were less or equal to or less than 0.5% with everything. So 0.5% with the river Oxaban, 20 milligrams once daily dose, 0.4% with the river Oxaban, 10 milligrams once daily dose, and 0.3% with aspirin. So very low rates of major bleeding. Next slide. If we looked at, uh, at less serious bleeding, so we looked at clinically relevant non-major bleeding, that cluster, uh, the third cluster of bars, or the combination of that plus major bleeding, you do see a gradient with the three treatments. So the rates of major or clinically relevant non-major bleeding, 2% with aspirin, 2.4% with the 10 milligram dose of rivaroxaban, and 3.3% with the 20 milligram dose. So again, very low rates of bleeding, both major bleeding and clinically relevant non-major bleeding, but a bit of a biological gradient as you might expect with a slightly higher rate with rivaroxaban than with than with, uh, with aspirin, and a slightly higher rate with the higher dose of rivaroxaban than the lower dose. Next slide. Okay, and it didn't matter whether the patient uh, had unprovoked or provoked DPE. Again, you get the reduction with both doses of rivaroxaban compared with uh, aspirin, whether they had a history of a prior VTE before this one, so this was recurrent VTE or not, or whether they had been treated for their original event for less than nine months or nine months or more, again, rivaroxaban was superior to aspirin for all of those uh, patients. Next slide. And the same thing with bleeding. Bleeding rates were low, whether they had unprovoked or provoked VTE, prior VTE or not, or a shorter or a longer course of initial anticoagulation therapy before they were entered in the study. Next slide. So I want to just jump down to how we define provoked versus unprovoked VTE. What we did in this study is the investigators, when they enrolled patients, they recorded risk factors for VTE, and then a central panel of adjudicators categorized the patients as having unprovoked VTE or provoked VTE, and the provoked VTE was subcategorized as to being due to a major provoking risk factor that was transient or a minor provoking risk factor that was transient or a major persistent risk factor, or a minor persistent risk factor. So the major persistent risk factor, that was active cancer. As I showed you, only 2% of the patients fell into that category. Next slide. Major transient risk factors were major surgery or trauma. Next slide. Minor persistent risk factors, inflammatory bowel disease, uh, lower limb weakness or paralysis, congestive heart failure, a high body mass index, a family history of VTE, or a hereditary thrombophilia. Next slide. And minor transient risk factors were 
brief periods of immobilization for at least three days, travel over six hours, the use of estrogens or pregnancy, and uh, leg injury with immobilization. Next slide. Okay, so now here we see the, the risk of recurrence by risk factor profile. So if we look at the first uh, line there, we've got unprovoked BPD. So with both doses of rivaroxaban, we had rate of recurrence 1.8% and 1.5% compared with a rate of almost 6% with aspirin. If the patients had major persisting risk factors, there were no recurrences at all with either dose of rivaroxaban and a 5% risk of recurrence with aspirin. With minor persisting risk factors, we had a risk of recurrence of 1.7 and 1.3% with the 20 and 10 milligram dose of rivaroxaban respectively and a risk of recurrence of almost 4% with aspirin. And with major transient, uh, with, sorry, with minor transient risk factors, virtually no recurrences with rivaroxaban, 3.3% with aspirin, and with a major transient risk factor like major surgery or trauma, no recurrences with any of the treatments. So this gives us more insight into the unprovoked VTE, we knew they're at high risk for recurrence. Rivaroxaban, 70% risk reduction compared with aspirin. We knew that the provoked patients whose VTE was provoked with by major transient risk factors, surgery or trauma, at low risk of recurrence. We confirmed that, and there were no recurrences with any of the treatments. And now we learn that patients with minor persistent or minor transient risk factors do have a risk of recurrence that's higher with aspirin than it is with rivaroxaban. And remember that compared with aspirin produces a 30% risk of reduction, you would expect that if the patients had been treated with placebo, the rates would have been 30% higher than what we saw in this study. Next slide. So there was another study done uh, some years ago that we reported uh, in 2012. This study took patients who had been treated for their index event, a VTE, for at least 6 to 12 months and randomized them to the prophylactic dose of a Pixban, Eliquis, 2.5 milligrams twice a day, to the treatment dose, five milligrams twice a day, or to placebo. And once again here, you see that both doses of Apixaban reduce the risk of recurrence by over 80% compared with placebo. And where all treatments were associated with very low rates of major bleeding, but if we look at non-major bleeding, you can see the lowest rate with placebo, the next lowest rate with the prophylactic dose of Apixaban, and the next rate with the treatment dose of apixaban. So like we saw with rivaroxaban, the prophylactic dose of apixaban or Eliquis is as effective as the treatment dose for preventing recurrence after patients have been treated for at least six months for their index event. And the prophylactic dose seems to be a little bit safer than the treatment dose. Next slide. In summary, in patients with symptomatic VTE who completed six to 12 months of treatment and for whom there was equipoise, it was uncertain whether they needed extended anticoagulation, we found that both rivaroxaban regimens were superior to aspirin for reducing the risk of recurrent VTE and were associated with similar rates of bleeding. And if we calculate the numbers needed to treat with the 20 or 10 milligram dose of rivaroxaban for one year compared with aspirin, we would 
need to treat around 30 patients to prevent one episode of VTE, and the number needed to harm with the 20 milligram dose is about almost uh, just under 400 patients, and it's uh, you know, it's, it's, it's huge, it's the number needed to harm with the low dose. It, it's not even calculable with these numbers. So the benefit of the of rivaroxaban compared with aspirin is evident from these numbers. So now we have an additional option for people who do need extended anticoagulation treatment for VTE. We can give the prophylactic dose of rivaroxaban or the prophylactic dose of uh, pixaban, and we expect that these prophylactic doses will produce very good reduction in the risk of recurrence and be associated with a low risk of bleeding, which then uh, makes it very easy for us to prevent recurrence in patients who have uh, a risk of that. So I will stop there, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. So how are we going to do the questions? Are they going to be, are people going to be able to come on and ask or how are we going to manage that? Thank you very much for this um, wonderful talk. Can you please just uh, describe the difference between major and non-major bleeding events? Yeah, okay. So major bleeding events are defined as overt bleeding, that bleeding that you can see that's either fatal, that occurs into a critical organ, that could be the brain, could be the pericardium, you know, around the heart, could be retroperitoneum that's behind the, the lower part of the abdomen, it could be uh, into a joint or into an eye, or bleeding that requires uh, transfusion of two or more units uh, of blood. And clinically relevant non-major bleeding is overt bleeding that doesn't meet the criteria for major bleeding, but requires the patient to uh, come in for a, to seek medical attention, to interrupt study drugs, uh, or to interfere with their uh, daily activities. Thank you very much. If I may, may I ask one more question, please? Sure. So if a patient um, supposedly had um, a provoked event and the BMI was, let's say, greater than 35, but the patient has lost 100 pounds, um, what is the what are the chances of them having another event? if they've lost a significant amount of weight. And and now with, with that weight loss, is their BMI still over 35? No, no, it's so not. If the, so if the VTE was provoked by a major transient risk factor like trauma or surgery, and they're uh, high BMI, they're not in the highest risk category for recurrence, but they're not in the lowest risk category. And so we make a decision about whether or not to extend anticoagulation. And it, as long as that person were active and, you know, uh, continued to have a healthy lifestyle, I probably would not continue. Thank you. Other questions? Dr. Weiss, I have a question. Sure. Um, I have had two incidences with blood clots 
uh, 18, approximately 18 months ago, or in January of 16, I had knee surgery and had a DVT, which was treated with a six-month round of Xarelto. Uh, back on July the 4th of this year, I had um, uh, basically a passing out attack, which uh, basically led to discovery of multiple pulmonary embolisms. The, the source of the multiple pulmonary, pulmonary embolisms was never found. The blood testing that I was uh, put to in the hospital, the hospitalist indicated that my blood indicates that there is no reason for me to be uh, having blood clots or even to be on blood thinners, but I'm currently on another six-month round, six round of Xarelto. Um, uh, and my family physician says that it's probably going to be a long-term uh, medication for me. Does this study, is this study some hope of indic that indicates that the, the decreased dosage of possibly Xarelto uh, is, is, looks to be a good indicator for what I might be looking at in the near future? Okay, so let me just find out one little bit of piece of information that you didn't uh, tell me yet, and that was when you had the pulmonary embolism that this year, did that occur after surgery or trauma, or did that just come oh. out of the blue? It was, it was an out-of-the-blue event. Okay, so then what your first event was a VTE that was provoked by the knee surgery, so a three-month course of anticoagulation would have been sufficient treatment for that. You got six months, that's fine. The second event was an unprovoked BTE event. And uh, in that case, what I would say is that if you were to stop your Xarelto at three months or six months, your risk of recurrence would be at least 10% at one year and 30% at uh, five at five years and the thing is that men are at higher risk for recurrence than women the increased risk is about one and a half to two fold higher for men than for women and the other thing is that you are three times more likely to have a recurrence in your lungs than you are to have recurrence in your legs because of this last event and we always worry more about pulmonary emboli than DVT because DVT can cause pain and swelling in your leg. But if you have a very big pulmonary embolism, that can, that can kill you. So the, what I would recommend for a man who had unprovoked BTE like you did, and you told me you even passed out, right? That is correct. Yeah, so I would say that you need uh, you need extended anticoagulation therapy, sort of indefinite anticoagulation therapy. And yes, the results of this study would suggest that after six months, you could consider going on the 10 milligram dose instead of the 20 milligram dose of Sorelto. But you should remain on indefinite anticoagulation, be it assess at least once a year for a balance of your risk of bleeding versus your risk of recurrence and seeing how you're doing. But yes, I think that the, what your family doctor is telling you sounds right on. Thank you very kindly for this, uh, for this presentation. And, and if I may, would there be a possibility of getting a copy of your slides for, to, to, to share with my family physician? Uh, absolutely. I'm sure that, uh, NATF can arrange that for you. Yes, you. we'd be happy to do that. Um, so another question, we've actually had it asked a couple of times over the chat is, uh, what is the status of reversal agents for patients who are on long-term anticoagulation and concerned about that? Okay, so let's talk about reversal agents. We have uh, a reversal agent for Pradaxa, for dabigatran which is, uh, I dare you, Sizubab or Praxbind. It is licensed in the U.S. and Canada for reversal of dabigatran. There is no licensed reversal agent yet for the oral 10A inhibitors, 
uh, Geralto, Eliquis, or Cerveza. There is a, a, an agent called Indexin at Alpha that is under consideration for approval by the FDA and by the European Medicines Agency, but it has not yet been approved. So the studies are still going on with that agent, uh, and uh, the results do look promising, but no health authority has yet to approve it. So at the moment, although we have no specific reversal agents, this is the way that I look at things, is that overall, the NOACs are associated with uh, at least a 50% reduction in bleeding into the brain compared with warfarin. And that's the most serious kind of bleeding. So you have half the chance of developing that type of bleeding. And the ha short half-life of the NOAX means that they go away very quickly. So the best antidote for the NOAX is just time. As long as patients can be supported, then, uh, you know, the NOAX will be cleared very quickly, especially if your kidneys are working well. And uh, we do use in very serious bleeds, we do consider the use of four-factor prothrombin complex concentrate. We don't have huge amounts of data in bleeding patients, but at our institution, that's what we've been using in a cohort study for patients who have life-threatening bleeding. And so far, we've treated about 35 such patients, and we've had pretty good results with just uh, prothrombin complex concentrate. That's the stuff that's used to reverse warfarin. Okay, thank you. Um, another question is, where does persistent anti-cardiolipin antibody in the bloodstream fall in the risk factors? Yeah. Uh, well, it persistent um, antiphospholipid antibodies are a risk factor for recurrence, and as is the diagnosis of antiphospholipid syndrome, that would be a probably considered a major persistent risk factor. And current guidelines based not on terrific data, suggests that patients who have persistent partly positive antiphospholipid antibodies or lupus anticoagulants should remain on extended anticoagulation. We don't have a lot of data with the NOACs in those patients. There are ongoing studies. If patients just have an antiphospholipid antibody and they had an episode of VTE, I have used NOACs in those patients. and. You know, I think that they work perfectly well. I might not uh, be so keen on reducing the dose after six months from the treatment dose to the prophylactic dose in those patients as I would in most other patients. The same thing might be true in patients who have a high-risk thrombophilia, like an antithrombin deficiency or a deficiency of protein C or protein S. Again, those types of patients weren't entered into the Einstein Choice Study, so I think you're better off staying on the full dose with those disorders. And remember, the full dose was very effective and had a very good safety profile compared with aspirin or compared with placebo in the Amplify Extension Study. For like special patient populations, in particular those with heart failure or cancer, is there anything that they need to keep in mind with long-term anticoagulation? Well, again, heart failure is one of those uh, minor persistent risk factors. It is a risk factor for, for VTE. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to treat such patients forever with, a, with an anticoagulant if they had a provoked VTE, but if they had an unprovoked or minimally provoked VTE, say they had heart failure and then they went on a, on a car trip and they developed the, the VTE after uh, just a minor provoking factor like a car trip, you might consider extended 
anticoagulation, and the low dose there after six months would be very reasonable in that case. Now, patients with cancer, that's a special case. If patients have VTE in the set of, setting of active cancer for which they're getting treatment with uh, chemotherapy or with biological agents, current guidelines suggest that the treatment be with low molecular weight heparin. However, if they have completed their, uh, their chemotherapy, uh, they say they had early stage disease, they've completed the chemotherapy, they have no evidence of, of cancer at that time, then you know, you, you can often stop anticoagulation, or if they've got stable metastatic disease, you can consider a NOAC instead of low molecular weight heparin. And there are studies comparing low molecular weight heparin with NOAC straight from the get-go. So we'll have more information on that special population very soon. Terrific. Um, are there any known side effects of taking these medications for long periods of time? Well, the major side effect of the NOACs are similar to the major side effects of any anticoagulation, anticoagulant, and that's bleeding. So bleeding is the, is the major side effect. Other side effects are extremely uh, unusual. Okay, great. Um, for a patient that is very active, loves to ski and play hockey, um, would you, what kind of questions would you advise them to ask their doctor when discussing being on long-term anticoagulation? Yeah, I mean, it, it depends what we're talking about. You know, again, contact sports are going to be problematic with full-dose anticoagulation. So, but just recreational skiing with a helmet, certainly possible. Skating and non-contact hockey, certainly possible. With extended anticoagulation with the lower dose would be ideal for those sorts of patients. And you can also think about if you're on rivaroxaban, for example, once a day, you can also think about the the timing of your doses. So, for example, often ice time is first thing in the morning. So you might, if you take your river rock span in the morning, you might delay taking your dose until you've had your early morning hockey. So you're always doing your act for it when your drug levels are the lowest. Or if you take Eliquis twice a day, for example, you know, if you're getting, if, you're, if your VTE event is kind of remote, then if you're really serious, then I've got some professional athletes who always play in the evening, for example. We can either delay their evening dose of eloquence or even uh, skip the, the evening dose on days that they play if they're not playing that frequently. So there are ways you can kind of make it more palatable and minimize the bleeding risk and still maintain the efficacy, even for patients who are going to be very, very active. When talking about bleeding risk, and you said that it's a lot better on the, the NOAX and warfarin, is that true in patients who are on warfarin that check their INR every day are in always and are always within range? Well, clearly patients that either self-monitor or self-manage their warfarin and have very very good uh, times and therapeutic range. They're getting the best out of warfarin, the best for efficacy and the best for safety. But even with the best time and therapeutic range with warfarin or other vitamin K antagonists, there's intrinsically a lower risk of bleeding into the brain with the NOAC than with warfarin. And uh, remember, the younger you are, that risk is is low for everyone, but as you get older, the risk of, of bleeding into the brain increases, and the no extra safer for the brain, uh, and no matter how well you manage the warfarin, that's just uh, one, of the, one of the characteristics of the no -X. Okay, and 
is there a preferred time of the day for people to take their anticoagulants? There, there isn't anything uh, magic about it. The patient should take their anticoagulants. It doesn't matter whether it's it's uh, warfarin or a NOAC. They should take it at about the same time uh, every day, particularly important with the NOACs that have a short half-life. It's important that Xarelto in the treatment doses I, uh, be, tra be taken with food. That's not important with... Uh, with Eliquis or with Cervesa. Also important with the Bigotran because it reduces the risk of uh, stomach upset if you take it with with food. And, uh, you know, otherwise it's, it's not so important. Warfarin, we usually have patients take their warfarin in the evening because then if they have their INR done in the morning, we can get the results back and give them advice about their dosing before they've taken that evening dose. But since we don't really monitor the NOAC, less important to take it in the evening. You can take it in the morning or the evening. But it, for example, Zarelto does need to be taken with a meal. Okay, excellent. And we got one um, last question that is not so much about anticoagulants, kind of looking for advice on how to move forward. Um, a young woman who has had a pulmonary embolism and um, is, she had it several months ago, about six months ago, and she still is experiencing chest heaviness and pain, um, shortness of breath. She's had a lot of tests. Everything's come back normal. Um, she's just really frustrated as to why she's still experiencing symptoms that cause her not to live her life like she did before her PE. Any advice or words of wisdom for her? Right. Well, sometimes the, the uh, symptoms of pulmonary embolism are slow to resolve. It's important in those cases to ensure that things are getting better. So, for example, if there was uh, an enlarged right side of the heart because of the large pulmonary embolism, an echo test should be repeated to see that the that the right side of the heart has now come down in size and to make sure that there isn't any evidence of recurrent pulmonary embolism, to check for other causes of shortness of breath with pulmonary function tests. And there is a very rare disorder that can occur where the clots fail to resolve in the lung and produce pulmonary hypertension, but that can be looked for with both um, a, uh, an echocardiogram and with, uh, with a lung scan. That's rare, but it can occur. And those are the sorts of things you have to be thinking about. Of course, make sure that be compliant and taking the medication. Okay, excellent. Um, let's just see, we've had one last question come in. Um, from a patient who's currently on two low-dose aspirin as well as 10 milligrams of Xarelto for a DVT that occurred um, about a year ago after a long car trip. Um, and she has anti-cardiolipid antibody and she's going to see her hematologist tomorrow. Um, is there anything that she should ask about her treatment? Um, or do you think she's under, it's what, the treatment she's yeah. on sounds reasonable. I, I think that uh, if she has antiphospholipid uh, syndrome, then aspirin is sometimes used in addition to the to a, an anticoagulant like Xarelto. And the use of aspirin in conjunction with an anticoagulant increases the risk of bleeding. But by using the 10 milligram dose instead of the 20 milligram dose, that kind of tempers that. So it sounds like what's happening is is reasonable. Uh, she could talk to the hematologist about the dose of aspirin. You said it's two low-dose aspirins per day. Is that necessary or is one sufficient? But it sounds pretty reasonable to me. Okay, excellent. Um, well, with that, it is just about 8 o'clock. 
Um, so we can go, we're going to go ahead and wrap up.